go ahead and share my screen. So first off, thank you so much for coming to our think tank. My name is Laura and I am an iPad and I'm joined by my colleague, Tyler. If you wanna give your introduction, I'll get this set up. Uh, hi everybody, uh, nice to, to be here as part of this think tank. I'm Tyler Kenner. I'm the STEM curriculum development lead for uh, the STEM at GTRI team over at Georgia Tech Research Institute. Uh, thank you. I'm just, this is my perpetual struggle with teaching too. I'm like trying to move my little windows around so I can see. I don't think I have access to chat when I'm in this screen. So maybe Tyler, can you keep an eye on that if yeah. anybody puts questions Absolutely. in there? So this is my first virtual think tank. We've done a lot of think tanks, particularly around esports and gaming in the past. And the goal that, um, you know, a lot of the goals of the think tanks are for them to be more casual conversations. So I, I hope that we can still do that here. If you have questions at any point, throw it in chat or you can hop on voice too. We have some slides uh, prepared, but this isn't really, this isn't a lecture. It's, it's not meant at any point if you wanted to jump in. You are more than welcome to do so. We're gonna be talking about esports and STEM or STEAM today. I've worn my Atlanta Rain jersey. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna be talking about gear, what is going on with STEM at GTRI and the different activities that we've got coming up and what we've also done in the past in terms of engaging our Georgia K through 12 students in pursuing STEM skills and STEM um, you know, careers through kind of the carrot at the end of the stick, which is games and esports. Did that slide advance for everybody? Yeah. Yes, okay, cool, so it's working. First, I'll talk about GEAR. So GEAR stands for Gaming and Esports Applied Research. I have worked at IMTC, so I'm a research scientist at IMTC. I'm a human factors psychologist. I work on a lot of gaming stuff, basically the, the psychology of games, game design, games user research. And for the past 10 years, because this May is my 10 year anniversary, we have worked on a variety of different kinds of gaming projects. And for uh, six or seven years, I wanted to try to kind of direct that research into uh, like a program with different buckets that this, these types of projects fell into. And in October of 2019, that coalesced into this research initiative called GEAR. We have three main pillars. In this think tank, we're mostly gonna be talking about the second one, but I wanna make you aware of the other ones, the things that we've got going on there in case you would like more information, if you would like to collaborate. And I also have a VIP class that's only about esports, and they're working on primarily the first and the third pillar that, that's represented here. And uh, any if anybody wants to like, you know, uh, leverage those students work or expertise or or come in and mentor parts of it too because there's a lot of expertise in ipad and of course on campus that can support them please let me know the first pillar is very broadly named it's called user support tools and it's all about how do we make tools that help different kinds of esports users now this does have overlay with stem when people think about esports users they tend to immediately think about esports athletes or players gamers but the edges of what a user is of esports are are blurring and they're kind of the the frontier is advancing so educators that are using esports in their classrooms schools that are implementing esports programs these are all esports users in addition to all the other careers in the ecosystem of esports that are uh, obviously team managers medical professionals, production, IT support, all the stuff that goes into making a live esports broadcast. If you imagine, so the Super Bowl is coming up this weekend. If you imagine how that works, pretty much every single job that exists in putting on a live broadcast of that, that size exists in, um, in a live esports broadcast. So you have you have analysts, commentators, color casters, and then camera people, directors, all the IT support, what happens if they lose power, all the backup systems, all that kind of thing. The second one that we're gonna be focused on, on here though, is how do we use esports as the motivator for K through 12 students to pursue STEM, STEAM skills and careers? 
probably for all of us at some point, there were educators, teachers, uh, maybe scientists and engineers also having these similar conversations. And you know, whenever we came up through school, how do we get kids interested in you know, being an engineer or being a scientist or, or going into a, a STEM type of field? For me, uh, it was marine science and I, I grew up near the coast. And so that was the carrot at the end of the stick was like, you wanna be a marine biologist? Sometimes it's space camp, robotics, Lego robotics. Throughout the ages, there's always been something to try to get kids interested in that. For a long time, it was game design. I'm interested or excited about esports because I think it casts a wider net than game design does because it's not just about coding and learning to make a game, which is important. It's also uh, how do you how do you work in a team? So all the things that go into maybe a high school football program, how do teams work together? How do they communicate? compromise, all that kind of thing you see also in esports teams. And then the last pillar, which the BIP class is working on heavily, is how do you support athletes and casual gamers and their support networks influence holistic wellness and health? All right, I'll check it to you, Tyler. Thanks, Laura. And so, um, so again, you know, I'm joining from STEM at GTRI, which is the K-12 educational uh, outreach team over at GTRI. And, and we do a, a lot of programming, the majority of it's state funded. And so, you know, we have a statewide purview um, in, in which the, the pandemic, you know, of course, uh, everybody would love to have that face to face programming. But from the point of view of uh, virtual programming now being the norm, we have been greatly helped in that regard in our statewide purview and in getting access uh, and getting schools from, you know, uh, Tolliver County and Thomas County and Warren County over by Augusta all the way up to um, you know, like Lumpkin County, all over the state to, to participate in the programming. And it's, uh, you know, uh, twofold. We've got the teacher development and support. So helping uh, teachers become more aware and familiar with, uh, you know, things like video games and esports and some of these STEM STEAM concepts that may not have been around when they were first doing their teacher training or, you know, the last time they went to grad school. Um, but now are becoming uh, more and more relevant to the K-12 classroom and K-12 teaching and learning. Then the second part is student experiences and outreach. So getting students um, and their families, communities excited about STEM, excited about STEAM, things like esports fit right into that. Laura is uh, participating in one of our Direct to Discovery interactions next week to talk about esports and um, video games in a way, you know, like Laura mentioned, in a way that's a lot more than just, you know, the coding and game design piece, which I think when uh, both students and teachers probably think about esports and video games as a potential career, that's probably what they key in on first, right? And so uh, that's going to have some accessibility pieces because some students might not be into sitting at a computer and coding or might not think of themselves as created enough to, to storyboard or design sprites. And, and the, the cool thing about what we do at STEM GTRI is that we don't do this in a vacuum. We work really closely with our stakeholders at the Department of Education. So uh, Brian Cox, Amanda Bice, uh, Megan McFerrin, Felicia Kohlers, uh, a lot of the, the schools and districts, you know, we have great contacts, principals, curriculum directors. And so we get a lot of uh, input on what the opportunities and challenges are in K-12 classrooms right now. Uh, you know, virtual learning, hybrid learning, the transition back from virtual to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of that input in, in a continuous stream. And so that really helps us to tailor and adjust what we're doing to support STEM and STEAM across the state. And so I'm really excited that Laura invited me on behalf of our team to this town hall to continue to get some of that feedback and input um, from you guys being uh, invested, interested stakeholders from the Georgia Tech, from the IPAC community. Uh, maybe you're just joining because you, you saw this on social media, who knows, but uh, you guys are certainly stakeholders with an interest in esports and video games. And so really interested to hear the conversation today because uh, that's going to help us and we'll talk more about some upcoming programming that we've planned in coordination with Laura and Gear, um, but also with future programming related to esports and video games. Thank you. And I, I'm looking at the list, and I feel like all of you have uh, heard me at some point talk about esports probably many times. But I realize now, let me just if, if you're not familiar with e what esports are, they're just games. They're video games played at a highly competitive level. That is the absolute best definition. 
you may have a kid that is playing esports titles. Some of these might sound familiar to you, like Fortnite or League of Legends or Overwatch. Uh, there's there's a bunch of games. There's a lot of games too that are playing at being played at a competitive level that don't look anything like that. I, there's a whole competitive online chess scene, which I think is super fascinating because the meta, like the game of how chess is played, is different online as compared to how it's played in person it, they're like almost completely different games they have the same rules and they look the same but the, the competition scene is completely different that's all it is esports can be a streamer streaming to no one if you go on twitch there's a lot of people streaming and there's nobody watching and then there's other streamers with tens or hundreds of thousands of people watching uh alexandria um or aoc as she's called on twitch Ocasio Cortez, she streamed Among Us, and I think she hit like 560,000 total viewers, and I think it was like 480,000 concurrent viewers of playing a very popular game that actually had been out for a while, but got this resurgence thanks to people getting stuck inside because of COVID. There are also live tournaments too, so if you have gone to a live sporting event, and if you've gone to a live concert, imagine those two things combined, and that's basically an esports tournament. People are kind of figuring out still right now what live esports tournaments look like, but they do look a lot like a rock concert and also like the, the Super Bowl. In terms of previous work that we've done with Gear and STEM or Gear and Steam, I think it was, uh, let's see, two years ago, we got a an engagement grant to take our VIP Future Experience of Esports class to Anaheim, California, where Blizzard, who's a major game studio and publisher, had rented out the old Tonight Show um, studio, television studio, and they were running their live esports tournaments there four days a week, eight hours a day. They had esports content, and most of the time it was packed. So we got some funding to take the students there because they were designing for the esports fan experience, and they needed to go and see what this was uh, going to look like, especially at a high production value, because that's what Blizzard's trying to do is is really make Overwatch the like NFL of esports, whereas a lot of other esports production is very grassroots and and kind of built from from a smaller community. We have had uh, with STEM Edge and TRI, we had the Games for Change student challenge to the series of game jams for three or four years. And there was one year, I don't remember because I'm very confused, like 2020 is just a blank spot in my head. So I can't really remember how long ago it was. I think it was 2017 that uh, I represented Georgia Tech on a panel at the Games for Change Festival, which happens in New York City every year. So a lot of it has been engaging students in game design, uh, game development, esports, and now we have moved to this next phase, phase. Because I'm a research scientist, that's the lens that I, I look through a lot of these problems. Currently, we have a bunch of gaps in understanding and implementation for our major stakeholders, which are schools like administrators, educators, parents, legal guardians, and students, there's a lot of gaps in understanding and implementation for why you would want to have gaming and esports at your school. So people fall along a spectrum. You have many schools, kind of the closer to Atlanta you get, you get these types of schools. They are convinced. They feel like gaming and esports are positive activities for their students. They want to implement an esports program. They want to have teams. They want to have game design classes, but they don't really know how to do it. If any of you needed to buy a computer tomorrow, you would have to do a lot of research. Even if you knew if you wanted a PC versus a Mac, you still need to do a lot of research. Now you're considering that you want to have a number of esports teams at your school. You need to buy PCs that are gaming PCs that are going to fit within your budget constraints and that won't be obsolete in a few years. But also you have to consider things like, do we have to buy special chairs? Uh, we can't just use regular mice. They have to be gaming mice, gaming keyboards. That's a lot of information and there's not really one spot yet where people can, or like a school can go to and know how to buy it. So that's a barrier. Then if you go all the way to the other side, 
you have uh, a number of these stakeholders that think games rot your brain, that they promote violence, that they're no good, they shouldn't be in schools, but maybe they're a little bit interested. So that's, that's a big problem. There's another problem where there's a disconnect between the understanding of what the state of the gaming or esports industry is and what students, educators, parents, schools think that looks like and how you get there. A lot of times when you talk to kids, they describe they want to be a director of games. They have this great game idea. They're going to tell you this really complicated story. Of, I've gotten all kinds of game pitches that are like they're Tolkien-esque levels of complicated. And that's their game. And really, they're talking about the director side of game design. They're not talking about game design. They want to be Steven Spielberg, but they don't want to be the person who's like planning the shots and looking for inconsistencies and and holding the camera. They don't want to do that. That's a lot of the important part of game development. So there needs to be a lot of education and communication that, uh, yes, coding and programming is very important, but there's also a lot more to being in the games industry that might be of interest. There's audio design. I have a friend who's going to law school for for games it's like that's a whole rife area of of just really interesting stuff of like how how do you get games into different markets and uh our loot box is gambling there's a lot of ethical issues there there's a lot of other types of, of fields and roles that someone can have in the games industry that's not just a coder so that's the problem we have a seed grant this year from stem at gtri to go in and look at this the first stage is this research. So this is like my bread and butter kind of research that I do with IMTC. What are the barriers and challenges, beliefs, attitudes to adopt and to their understanding of what esports and gaming in a school looks like? What do they need to know? What are their questions? What do they think it means to go into the games industry? What skills do they understand are important for those types of careers? And then from that, from that contextual inquiry, we do an engagement um, in the form of a workshop. So we have a number of really great industry partners who are also interested in these problems because it's good for them. It's good for the industry if we have young people coming up and going into that industry that are uh, equipped and skilled and interested. So we're going to host this workshop that's informed by this research that directly addresses these questions that people have and give them the opportunity to interface with people actually in the industry and learn how they got there. One of the benefits of COVID is that you, we have to do this virtually, but that actually means we can reach out much further than just Atlanta, just Metro Atlanta and go across the state. So that workshop is basically going to be a link like, hey, this is open. We can accommodate as many people as want to join and uh, students, educators, parents, anybody can join this and they can get that interface with people in the industry that can say how they got there. I'll tell you right now, there's a weird number of biologists in the games industry. Uh, so I was in biology for 10 years. A lot of my colleagues in games user research were biologists and transitioned in the games industry for whatever reason. So there's some weird paths, which I think are important for students to know about. And they can directly ask people, hey, in 10 years, 20 years, when this person is going to be a young professional, like, where do you think the industry is going? So here are some of our partners we've worked with for um, quite some time. So the partnership really started with High res Studios. They are a major player in the games industry. They have headquarters, international headquarters all over the world, but their main headquarters is in Alpharetta. So probably one of the more important things I've done in my career was to literally go knock on their door uh, five or six years ago and make that partnership. And the co-founder of hi -Res then went to go start Skillshot, which is an esports production and experience company. And then that person, Todd Harris, who's super influential, is a chairperson for the Georgia Scholastic Esports Federation, of which I am a board member. And we also work with Atlanta Rain, um, the jersey that I'm wearing, which is the Overwatch League franchise for Atlanta. And we have some other partners that we're working with, but these, this is kind of that ecosystem of people we're pulling in for the C grant to have uh, 
all of these important Georgia stakeholders in K through 12 be able to talk to. So the overall process and at any point, like if, if you wanna collaborate, if you have activities that fit within this, please get in touch with me and let me know. Again, as a research scientist, the first piece for me is always research of just trying to figure out where are the pain points for schools adopting these things. We know esports and gaming are good motivators and, and good catalysts for developing STEM skills. There's a lot of actual empirical research, a lot of it done by UC Irvine. In this space, they have a, an esports summer camp that they've done a lot of research in for about four or five years, finding that students not only develop you know, these soft skills like compromise, communication, teamwork, um, interpersonal skills, being a part of an esports team, but they also learn hardware, uh, tinkering with hardware, trying to get that family computer to eke out a little bit more performance, playing with the home Wi-Fi network to get better speeds, website design to make flashy websites to show off the team, video editing to make highlight reels, social media, uh, just learning how to like, how do you have a social media campaign to hype things up? So there's a lot of nice research, but there's still that gap. How do these schools actually do this? Then how do we take what we learn there and use all the expertise and resources we have at Georgia Tech to address those challenges, to kind of lower those barriers and ease those pain points? And then the iteration, which methods are really appropriate? Are they workshops? Are they, um, are they skill shares, mentorships? What does that look like? And then continuing that engagement piece as we kind of do a, a full circle to go back into research. So for schools, it's very useful to have access to students so we can inform our research, but then how do we give something back to them? Industry is also very interested in engaging with education how like how do how do we make that uh, a two-way street for them for us with my vip class the industry partners that we have they have a, a hiring pipeline i've gotten a couple of students in just a couple of years hired into high res because of the work that they've been doing with our vip class uh actually i'll save this to the end and tyler i'll let so, you actually, sell I, this part if you want to just oh. pause actually um it may yeah. be we just we can just pause the screen share for a second. I don't know. I don't want to break anything. Um, but again, I mean, so of course the the pandemic has a silver lining when it comes to like virtual programming. Um, the real reason that like all of our virtual programming for STEM and GTRI or or even the face to face programming, uh, whenever that will resume, is is successful is because uh, we have such fantastic you know individuals like Laura who bring their expertise and their enthusiasm for their subject um, to the programming. So that's the real reason it's successful. And and so. Um, when Laura floated this opportunity to collaborate on this work, you know, bridging sort of the where folks are across the state in esports and video games and using video games in the classroom and, you know, what offerings exist, uh, that, that's just so cool because it's really kind of like the cutting edge. And so I'm wondering maybe for the, for the sake of stakeholder input for the town hall, a little bit selfish on my end too, because I'm just really curious, you can either, you know, put in the chat or maybe unmute yourself. Um, like what, what opportunities, what challenges do you think, do you see, um, I, you know, existing in, again, you know, uh, this is beyond the Atlanta metro area. Like Laura said, I think the Atlanta metro area probably has the highest concentration of um, esports teams. You, you might be surprised Georgia is one of the few states in the nation that has officially sanctioned esports as a high school sport, uh, which is really cool and I think speaks towards esports as an industry. Uh, that we're really keen on developing students uh, for, you know, sort of that workforce development piece, uh, helping, you know, the state be the technology capital of the East Coast. And so in the chat, unmute yourself, uh, either or, uh, but just to be selfish and kind of hear what other people are thinking, what opportunities or challenges do you think, could you imagine, uh, we could run into as we try to, you know, um, increase a, a portfolio of esports and video games educational outreach programming. I used to be a high school physics teacher, so I am super used to asking a question and getting no response. Um, so chances are I can out I can outweigh <laughs> everybody on this call. I'm sure I can. 
Um, but to illustrate my thinking, you know, one thing I think, Laura, you mentioned like buying a computer, like funding is a really big, you know, issue. And so if I'm a school, you know, um, in, a, in a place where I just don't have a ton of external funding, I don't have any great community partners that are going to just, you know, dump a, a, a new computer lab in my lap, uh, you know, esports and video games probably sounds like something that's going to be really expensive for me to do. And so what are the not expensive ways that I could get my students and my teachers in on this idea without trying to buy, you know, a set of, you know, 20 uh, vibes, right? The headsets or the Oculus uh -huh. headsets, because that's like not possible. And is that for me? Is that generally? What's that? Is that is that a me question or a general? Oh, that's just like a general, yeah, I'm just illustrating my thinking. Yeah. And Laura, you might have, I mean, you've, you've been living this work, so you probably have more of an idea, but I'm going to put my, my teacher and former um, K-12 administrator light hat on and just kind of think about, you know, if, if I'm getting interested as a school building administrator, as somebody who makes those decisions, right, a, a decision maker in a district or in a school building, you know, cost is going to be one of those really big things. The other really big thing that I think is, is good to remember when we have uh, conversations about uh, workforce development, because um, whether this is esports or or coding, um, AI is another big one that there's a big conversation around. Um, one of the really cool things that um, I think you know the state is doing is that uh, they're being super responsive with the standards in the curriculum. Um, so I know that there are you know new standards being uh, approved, developed, and approved by the state all the time that respond to these workforce development needs. But that's the other really big thing is. Um, when I'm that school building administrator and I'm and I'm looking at how I uh, create my after school programs, what after school programs we offer, where we put our funding, you know, where I put my teachers, making sure that I've got my core bases covered, of course, you know, the, the graduation requirements, but then also those electives and, and making sure that there's a real standards basis for this piece. Um, you know, so gaming, of course, we think about that a lot as being embedded in those computer science standards, most likely. Um, which is a little tricky because then you're you're limited to the students that only are interested in those computer science courses. And Laura, as you said, there's so much more to it, right? It's a much broader ecosystem than just people who design the games and type the code to make it work. And so what are other ways that we can think about expanding that, you know, who is exposed to um, this as an opportunity um, beyond just outside of computer science courses. And of course, like I said, there's exciting things that, you know, the state's working on to do that. Um, but then also, you know, um, just what are some of the ways to put esports and gaming into other places in the curriculum? Lee, I see you put in the chat, so, um, so a good opportunity with, you know, the computer science standards, but then the curriculum standards and the various paths in middle school and high school. And so definitely, I mean, um, just again, kind of have that, that school building administrator hat on, um, you know, that's a super important thing that, um, you know, cause they're really focused on some day-to-day -day business of just supporting students and their learning, right? Making students that, that students can go through school and like learn how to read and write and do arithmetic, you know, which are the like super fundamental skills that students need to have when they graduate from high school. Um, and so, you know, I'm just thinking about in, there's some slides, but I don't really, I mean, the slides are whatever, but even like language arts or math, right? How you can, um, and Laura, that, you don't need to put the slides up, that's okay, unless we needed to refer back to them, but, uh, you know, like how you could use video games in a standards-based way, you know? So like in language arts, you know, oftentimes in language arts, like you read a book or you read a passage from a book, which is important, like you need to practice reading, but how could you get some engagement and some enthusiasm for language arts, right? Because uh, if I'm a student, I might not be that interested in Macbeth or Romeo and Juliet. I know personally, I was never interested in neither of those. So, um, but how could you talk about some of the literary themes that are in those two stories in a medium that's not the book, right? So you could, I mean, video games, right? A lot of times are interactive stories, especially the ones that are, are written really well and you know they have a really great production team behind them. So how could you use one of those to talk about, you know, literary themes like or literary, um, you know, techniques like like foreshadowing um, or, you know, I'm trying to think of some of my language arts standards that are, you know, there's a really big emphasis, especially in middle school and understanding how, you know, you get to a certain chapter in a story and how it contributes to the story at large. So if I'm reading a chapter book, you know, one chapter is going to have this one event happen or it's going to have 
um, like I said before, some foreshadowing happen. So then when you finish reading the whole piece, you're able to look back and analyze how this one section contributed to the whole of the story. Um, and so, you know, that being a way that you could take a video game. And I think there's a million examples of video games where there's, right, a mission or a quest or a chapter in the video game that then when you finish the game and look back on it, it has a much different um, role in the whole story than it may have had in that exact moment. And Lee, again, that professional development need, absolutely. So, and that's where that bridge between, you know, Georgia Tech expertise, industry expertise, and those K-12 teachers comes into play where, so the thing that I just talked about, right, well, that's not something that teachers, by and large, um, certainly as someone who has a taught teacher uh, prep before at the undergraduate level, um, that's not something that is talked about. Because again, we're really focused on uh, making sure that every student from that K-12 point of view, making sure every student gets the things that they need, um, you know, in terms of, again, those foundational pieces that are gonna enable them to go out in the world and be just a productive, capable citizen. And so then, you know, it's just, teaching is a hard job. There's so much. You could take an eight year course and everything about teaching and still like not learn. I mean, it's so dynamic, it's an art, it's a science. And so I'm not faulting teacher prep, but there's just so many pieces that I think um, from the outside point of view, it's important to kind of keep that lens that, uh, you know, professional learning, professional development is uh, so much like a value added piece because it's gonna be a lot of things that teachers have never heard before. Um, Noah, I see, so outside well, of the CS but, but route, I wanna... Yeah, I, I sorry, want to speak Lord. to something you said before Noah's question. So uh, you, you talked about technology requirements, which are, are really important. And every student in Georgia gets a Chromebook, right? That's my understanding. So, uh, um, right, Tyler, most students get a Chromebook. I would say, yeah, by and large. Um, but that is not a that is not a literal statement in that the state yeah. really provides a Chromebook, but that most times schools have decided to spend some of their funding on providing Chromebooks. Gotcha, okay. So if you're not familiar with Chromebooks, they're just kind of like snazzy web browsers. You can do some basic things with them, like word editing, um, but they're not super powerful. They're not going to run uh, Rocket League on them. But what I'm excited about that reduces the technology requirements are more cloud-based types of games or coding widgets. So we'll do something that you see on Twitch a lot. Put a one in chat if you've heard about GeoGuessr. GeoGuessr is this new kind of rising gaming phenom. If you go on Twitter, sorry, if you, well, probably Twitter too, but if you go on Twitch, you are going to see a lot of streamers playing GeoGuessr. So I'm gonna screen share real quick. All right, GeoGuessr is a really brilliant use of taking freely available data from Google Maps and making a game out of it. So you go to this website and I think um, we'll go to Country Streak. We're gonna just do single player start game. I I did create an account this the whole time. Oh, okay, anyway, I, I've i gotten caught in this like loop where I approved the account. Let's do this. This is the dangerous thing. You can see all of my guinea pig recommendations and hiking. All right, GeoGuessr. So what it, it does- Is it possible is, that loop is part of the game? I, it's, if it is, it sucks. <laughs> I, little, I've approved it meta. multiple times. So what it does is it drops you onto Street View. You're playing against other people. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if you look at the top, you can see these other players. And you have to, in this case, he's playing country. Others, if you play in just one country, you might be cheating. Uh, you have to get within several miles of where you're looking. So you are just cruising down the road, just like we've all done with Street View. And the license plates are blacked out. You're trying to, like, those kind of look like European street signs to me. Now we're in a different place. But this is basically the game. You compete with people. This would be a great game to play in, in a student group because it's all about, like, uh, you're looking for different kinds of features. Maybe you find different languages. So the, the tip off is if you're like, wow, that, that looks like maybe it's in Russia or Ukraine or there's mountains. Uh, like, yeah, he's trying to pick it right now. 
So he guessed Ghana. You get three guesses. Yeah, Senegal. Oh. This this person's really good. Sometimes it'll drop you in the middle of nowhere. I was watching a streamer last night and it looked really familiar to me. And it was actually really close to where I grew up and it was just in the middle of nowhere. So, wow, this person's really good. Hungry? Yeah, that nobody's wow. that good. Um, but yeah, this is a really a, a cool thing that is getting really big right now. And on Twitch, there's just a ton of people that are, are streaming this and it's something that you could do on a tablet. It's very simple, it's web-based. And, and so Lauren, all right, that's all you want to I'm so I'm so uh, like psyched that you uh, shared that because that's um, again like this is the this is the importance right of having like outside experts industry experts but then uh, some sort of like opportunity to connect those to K12 teachers because again like that's not something that um, now I'm sure some teacher somewhere because teachers are super motivated. And when they find something that they think is going to connect to their students, they run with it a lot of times. And so I'm sure some social studies or uh, geography teacher has taken that and like started using it in their classroom. But you know what opportunities exist to bring together a you know multidisciplinary team to create something really usable, right? Some like actual resources, some lessons using this that then tie into. Um, those standards in social studies that are all about map reading or I'm even thinking like art mm -hmm. or art history where you could talk about architecture or even um, like, you know, uh, 20th century history and its impacts on like architecture and like city planning. And so just so many different things. But again, like one of the big uh, you know hurdles that you kind of get over is that um, showing that you um, are not just trying to do something cool. Of course, like cool things and engaging things are great, but also like meaningfully productive to students and like building that knowledge and building, um, you know, like building knowledge and skills for students. And then with that piece, that workforce development, right? Cause then this opens up that door to that conversation where, hey, you know, this actually from a resource point of view and Noah, this kind of goes to what you were talking about um, a little bit, which is getting outside of that CS route. This doesn't tie into that really the other points in your comment, which I'll get to, but you know, this is not super uh, in in the grand scheme of things, right? Like we're not, this isn't like Unity, this isn't Unreal Engine, this is just some Google Maps and some coding on top of that. I'm probably really, really minimizing the amount of work that went into it, but hopefully everybody gets my point. Which is <laughs> there's a lot more probably creativity than like computer science technicality in like technical knowledge that went into this, um, but still has a really cool, you know, uh, well, number one, it's really cool, really fun. People play it, but then also from a K twelve lens, like has a really cool like tie in and in ways that students could use it. Where do you think and also are? really accessible, being able to be run on Chromebooks and tablets. Hmm. Hmm. Read anything else on that side? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, Noah. Uh, sorry, did you answer Noah's question or? Oh, sorry. I, I didn't. I was going to just, I was waiting to see if there was, I, I was distracted by the game. I won't lie. So, but I know, so I know. I'll stop about, playing like, it now. But... The production pieces, which I think, I mean, Noah, you can unmute yourself um, and just kind of share your thinking if you want to. Otherwise, I can just comment, which sure. is cool too. Yeah, okay, I, cool. Can, I can share my thought or question. Yeah. So, I, I love the idea of sort of applying esports like across all of these classes and fields and whatnot. But thinking about like, yeah, like the, the esports industry as being this really large thing and requiring production and whatnot. Like, we think of like esports as being computers and starting there. But it would be really interesting. And I, I have I haven't worked with high schools at all, so I have no idea what like or middle school. Like, I have no idea what the feasibility of this would be. But like involving theater courses, like can you get people to start like practicing to be announcers for esports, right? How do you become better at announcing and you know working through that side of things, or looking at the design aspects of it, but not necessarily the software design, but the hardware design. So could you have so like could you have students designing gamer chairs? or looking at mice as a way mm -hmm. of studying industrial design and ergonomics and engineering in that aspect and sort of tying these things. Could you have a, 
a school using their own custom 3D printed mice, right, in their esports competitions. Um, I, I think there are a lot of kind of interesting opportunities. Um, we've run some projects here at Tech doing arcade game design where you build the controller and design the game for your arcade game. It's like a game jam style approach, but making hardware. And I think that could be just kind of extending that out, just that another kind of ring further into who you can bring into it. Well, that's a great point. So I guess to, I'm going to add a thought, but that's going to require me to like unpack a little bit. So, you know, thinking about like esports and gaming, of course, kind of like where I started was the obvious connection, right? Which is what you said, which is that computer science piece. And that's where most people immediately go. Um, and of course, like those are elective courses. The theater courses are elective courses, you know, um, industrial design. I, I'm not sure if that's actually a course that's offered, but there are plenty of engineering courses that do a lot of industrial design projects as part of their like core curriculum. Um, and so there's, there's definitely that piece, right? And just to think, gosh, as you were talking, like you could do a school-wide project where the whole thing is producing an esports, you know, event where you've got the, the, you know, the gaming club, and then you've got some people doing, you know, maybe they've done something like this where they've designed and 3D printed some adaptive joysticks that help with the aiming. And then you've got the theater club, you know, doing, you know, lighting and sound and then the announcing, right? Some like, some arts piece to it, um, some graphic arts with marketing and business piece as well, selling tickets, you know, doing the actual business end of it. So, I mean, Laura, I don't know, have any schools done that where they've like produced the whole like really kind of professional because I, I think one thing that, that folks on the call might be surprised by is, um, you know, I, I had mentioned before that like a lot of like the business and I approached this through the lens of I was a, a science teacher. So I was always really focused on like the core knowledge that students needed to have. But when it comes to, like that workforce development piece and the electives piece, especially in high school, schools are doing crazy stuff nowadays. Like you'll have schools that have whole student run businesses the school that I taught at, they had something called Creek Squad. So they would have, you could bring in your phone and they would fix your phone, or you could ask them to build you a computer and they'd build you a computer. And so, um, you know, what schools are doing for workforce development is really crazy compared to even 10 or 15 years ago. But Laura, are there any examples, let me get to my question, where schools are doing really crazy esports workforce development? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, that That's Part of what we're hoping to do with our VIP, of course, that's not K through 12. Control Freak, this video that I'm showing here is one of our partners that's informing that it has a lot of ID components. There's a lot of ergonomics, this kind of other stuff that goes into creating esports products and, and stuff that goes into that whole domain, like these little thumb risers. But I don't know of any K through 12 that has done that. The focus is really on like coding, learn Scratch, you uni learn Unity, learn Java, that sort of thing. Has yeah. there been any interaction with uh, Georgia Public Broadcasting at all? Because I know they do, they do high school football broadcasts. Has there been any like ah. effort to do high school esports broadcasts? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Mm -mm. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't, I mean, surely, surely someone somewhere broadcasts, because I know that they have tournaments, right? Because it's a sport. So surely, I don't know. Um, but I think Laura, I mean, surely the folks at GCEF would know more about that, right? Because that's that, mm -hmm. the Scholastic, the Athletic Association, essentially, for Georgia esports teams. I think the, the summary is of esports and K through 12 and kind of in general is it is a wild west. We, there's a lot of parallels that we can draw with traditional sports. So the NFL is the league for American football. The NHL is the league for, you know, North American hockey. We don't have that for esports. And part of that is because the games are so divided up. There's just so many games and new games come out all the time. It's not like we have a lot of new sports that come out all the time. People aren't inventing new sports and particularly new sports that wind up on television. Really the Olympics drives that and they're not new sports. They're just new to us when suddenly everybody's like really interested in curling. There are a lot of leagues, both in the 
K through 12 and college and professional area that are trying to be the NFL of, of esports. And we're at the early stages of learning who will win. Like MLB went through this uh, for Major League Baseball. There were a lot of other baseball leagues at the time when baseball was getting popular and MLB just won. So there's not a lot of organization. Uh, no one really knows what esports will be or what it will look like or what it even is currently now. There's a lot of economic and financial buy-in to this. And there's a lot of talk about it being bubbles too. Cities are paying 50 to 120 million for an esports franchise with no idea if that's ever going to pan out. So suffice it to say, like, we're all working this out, which is why this is, is really exciting. In the K through 12 space, we can invent a lot of what we think the activities are that connect with current standards, but also that will make for an attractive and competitive workforce. Uh, but a lot of the times when people ask, like, well, has this been done before? I mean, I don't know because it could be done right now. It could have been done yesterday. But in a lot of cases, it's like, no, but maybe we should be the ones who are doing that. So Tyler, I want to return to the slides so that you can yeah. pitch or proselytize oh, yeah. sure, these the upcoming opportunities things yeah. that are happening in our, our last like 10 minutes or so. Absolutely. Sorry, no, my, my gears were turning. Noah had mentioned GPB and then you had mentioned the Olympics. So I was just thinking like the Olympics of esports and what that would look like. That was the idea that was in my head. But let me talk about things that are happening now versus like three years from now, potentially. Um, <laughs> and so again, like we were... Uh, you know, Stimaji and I were super excited to have Laura in our orbit. Um, and next week, as one of our speakers for a director discovery session, again, thinking that workforce development piece, how do we get students interested and aware of what esports in the gaming industry look like in the state? Um, all the different ways you can be involved in it. You know, you can get to esports and gaming as a career in a way that doesn't involve going straight from high school to undergrad to major in computer science and then hoping for an internship with a development company. And there's a lot of different roles you can have. To support teachers, right, because again, you know, I had talked a lot about that standards alignment and, and what teachers, you know, when they do the, the teacher prep or when they do professional learning, there's so many other plates that are spinning in K-12 um, that you know, oftentimes, you know, we aren't getting to esports or gaming. If you're, a, you know, if you're a language arts teacher, you're not, we're not talking about using video games as a tool to analyze literary devices. Um, if you're a computer science teacher, maybe, but beyond that, probably not. And so we're really excited to offer this Explorer Guild. It's a professional learning series for teachers, uh, four parts in March. And we're going to go all the way from dispelling myths about video games and gaming, all the way to some uh, classroom examples of teachers that have used games to teach concepts that aren't coding. And so we're going to do that um, in four sessions in March in the afternoon. And so... If you're interested, of course, you know, they're targeted towards teachers, but I think all are welcome to join to pop in and see what we're doing and, and see the, the cool things that Laura and I and, and other professionals that we're going to team up with. I, I think, Laura, you know, we're going to cross our fingers for Todd Harris's availability to work out for him to join. Oh, us he's already in. Oh, all right. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. I didn't, yeah, I didn't yeah. want to, like, you know, promise it and not deliver, <laughs> but that's, that's really cool. Yeah, I forgot so, to tell you, so that's, that's my bad. <laughs> No, no, no. But uh, so, I mean, yeah, if you know a teacher, feel free to, to share this information with them. And then, of course, the third one is the question marks. I know uh, hopefully this is going to be the first few things that we do uh, between gear and STEM and GTRI to, like I said, really increase the footprint of our educational outreach across the state. Right. So not just Atlanta Metro, but how do we reach schools, you know, uh, all the way down in like Tolliver County, um, you know, in engaging in esports and video games in the gaming industry. So really looking forward to that with Laura. And then, of course, with everyone else on, on this town hall, if you have any ideas, Laura, you can skip through these. Um, that was really just kind of me thinking. But um, you look so cool. But but yeah, we'll so share these slides, too, if that's OK with you, Tyler. And I'll, I'll let you edit them if, if you need to. But we can make them available to people. No, that works. And so, Laura, I'll, I'll pass it back to you to, to carry it on home. But just want to say to everybody on this call, you know, uh, thanks for, for joining and, and really hope that um, something about this has inspired or, or motivated you or spoken to you. And so if you have any interest in joining up with this work, I mean, definitely appreciate ideas, input, guest speakers, everything. Laura, I'll toss it to you. 
Yeah, okay, thank you. The last thing I wanted to do is actually go back to where I just skipped over it, I think. Uh, I want to give you an update on our first, or that is what inaugural means, I guess. So the <laughs> inaugural iPad eSports Invitational that we did in December of last year. So that's something, you know, Shiva and I were working on that a year ago and we even were meeting about space. It was initially supposed to be an in-person event. I remember being in CODA, looking at the space and at the same time having conversations of like, do we think this COVID thing is going to be a problem? And then, you know, we live now. This ideally in the future is going to be an in-person event, but we had a really great virtual event that was supported by our partners with Skillshot Media, because this is, is what they do. If you are a Twitch person, I recommend that you go follow them on Twitch. They do a lot of the uh, North American Scholastic Esports Federation, so NASEF tournaments that happen with the collegiate esports tournaments that go on, also GSEF, so for Georgia. We had a lot of really great panelists. We had two panels, one that I moderated with people from NASEF, GSU. We had the VP of GT Esports there as well. We had 350 peak viewers on a Tuesday morning, which I think is pretty good for us on Twitch. I got to live my Twitch streamer dreams briefly for a moment. And then of course we had a Rocket League tournament. And the good news is that Georgia Tech won because it was Georgia Tech. So we had first place was Georgia Tech, second place was Georgia Tech, and you know, third and fourth. And they had a lot of good fun playing it. Uh, I think Rocket League, if you're not familiar, it's it's soccer played with cars. <laughs> They're just little cars and they, they play soccer. It's a really easy game to look at and know what's going on as opposed to some other esports games are much more difficult to parse out. So in for the next iteration, uh, I already have the contacts lined up. You know, we want to make this kind of like Battle of Atlanta, Battle of Georgia, KSU, GSU, Morehouse, uh, UGA, they're all in Georgia Southern and want to compete. So we can look forward to that uh, in a vaccine world, I suppose. But if you have any questions about this, let me know. And also, if you go to the iPad YouTube page, which you should also you know, subscribe and like below, click the bell. You will find all four hours, uh, you know, things like three or four hours of the esports invitational that you can scrub through. So if you want to watch the panels, Todd Harris had the second panel about economic development and kind of the future of esports. My panel, we talked about the role of universities and driving the future of esports. All right, so with that, I just want to leave some more room if anybody has questions or comments. Any anything we should know about? Uh, you know, there's so many groups on campus between Seismic and Constellations, and these are all partners that we have and want to make sure that we're cross promoting and and um, having just the maximum impact we can. Kids that are playing Fortnite endlessly. It's not really the game anymore. People aren't playing Fortnite as much as they are. Uh, kind of what's the new hot like esports game that people are playing? Valorant. I think Rocket League's still always up there. Games don't rot your brain. Though it feels like it sometimes. If anybody's playing Pokemon Go still, send me that friend code. <laughs> Well, if there's no other questions, we can wrap up and, and Tyler, you and I can hang out if anybody wants to talk after, but thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Everybody. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Tyler. We appreciate it.